then let's take a moment. Remember the reason we are gathered together today is to worship the living God. We're coming from a lot of different places and your mind is running in a million different directions. But now it's time to, to quiet our thoughts and to ask the Lord to enable us to worship Him in the way that He desires to be worshipped. So let's take this moment of quiet together today. Father God, hear our prayers and receive our worship. In the Psalms, we find these words in Psalm 24, which was the Psalm of David. The earth is the Lord's in the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand? In his holy place. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him and who seek the face of God of Jacob. Selah. Lift up your heads, O gates. And be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah. Let's pray together. Father God, remind us that while you are a loving and gracious and merciful God, you are the Lord of hosts. You have your army, and they follow your commands flawlessly. There is no one who can go against you and stand. There is no power on earth that can withstand you. There is no one who can survive rebelling against you. And Lord, we come here together in this place as those who have rebelled, as those who went our own way, those worthy of your judgment. And yet we are gathered together because your judgment was satisfied. Your anger was turned away from us and fell upon another. Our sins, our rebellions were taken from us and placed upon one who willingly took it upon himself namely your Son, Jesus Christ. And so you are not a weak judge that ignores sin. You are a mighty judge who unleashed the fullness of your power upon your own Son that today we might stand here as part of your family, worshiping you, for you are holy and just, and mighty in battle. And we thank you for this in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Whom shall I fear? May we all stand and sing.
shall I fear? I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever. He is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. I'll be reading this morning from 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 10. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your love, that you love us immeasurably. You love us to the point of protecting us, defending us, walking with us. And I pray, Father, that you would just increase our faith, that we would um, always remember and rely on you, your love, and your love that will defend us. Amen. 
Father God, you truly are great. When we think of the vastness of your creation, universes that we have yet to come to see, add it all together, they cannot match your greatness, your majesty, your love for us, and your mercy and your grace. And so, Father, as we've gathered together in this holy hour, we offer our hearts to you. And out of the depths of our love for you, we give back this offering to you. We ask, Father, for wisdom in how to use it according to your desires and your plan, that your kingdom may spread throughout the world and others may be able to say, how great thou art. Amen. Will you pray with me this morning? Gracious Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this new year. We're thankful because it reminds us as we begin to look at our life with a blank slate and trying to do our best we're thankful because it's a reminder of the reality in which we live as believers. That when you forgive us, you see us as clean. Our ledger before you has been wiped empty. All sins paid for. And you do not treat us in accordance with the sin of which we've committed against you, but instead you treat us as your children who are righteous and blameless before you, not because our own deeds were righteous, but because Christ's deeds were righteous, and they cover us. And so, Father, we pray as we are here today that you would help us to have a right understanding of how you look upon us. That we would have a proper response to the way that you have loved us. And that all of this would be proper worship before you. So we ask now, Father, that you would open the scriptures to us today. Not just that our Bibles would be open, but that our minds would be open to understand them. And that our hearts would be corrected. And that our wills would be molded by the truth that you show us through your Holy Spirit. So speak to us now, Father. Your servants are listening. Amen. If you would, go ahead and grab a Bible and open to the book of Malachi. Now, if you're new to the Bible or you just haven't been in Malachi in a long while, the easy way to get there is to find Matthew, which you're more familiar with, and hang a left towards the Old Testament very slowly, and eventually you'll get there. When go deciding to go through the book of Malachi, I began seeing what kind of resources I had for it and realized it wasn't much. And then I started to look at some of the, I, there's some preachers that I listen to on a regular basis and to see what kind of sermons had they preached. And to be honest with you, two of them that I often listen to had exactly zero sermons from Malachi, to which I went, this may have been a mistake. Um, what I knew about Malachi other than, you know, I've read through it, you know, I've, I've done the yearly plans and I've gone through the, the Bible and, and read it, but what I knew about Malachi was there was something about tithes in it and God doesn't like divorce. Other than that, I really didn't have much of a clue on what the heartbeat of Malachi was. And so the next seven weeks together, I, I pray that as we go through this book that we understand truly that it's far more than tithes and even though it talks about divorce that's not his main point point. and so when I approach a book 
Oftentimes I try to find what is that main idea that runs throughout the entire book. And as I was going through this, I'm going to give you this and then we'll read today's text. But the, the overarching, the, the melodic line, if you would, that sings throughout the book of Malachi is that God faithfully demonstrates his covenant love to his people despite their response. That as we go through verse after verse, we're going to be able to hang from that line. Now, there's a lot of kind of big words in there, and that just helps me to think through it. If you want the Cliff Notes version of that line, God loves you, what are you going to do about it? All right, some, some of you are like, that one I can remember. So if, if that's the one you like, hang on to that one. But the bigger one is that God faithfully demonstrates his covenant love to his people despite their rebellious Response. So today we begin this book together. Malachi chapter 1, verse 1. Here's our text. The oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord. But you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackals of the desert. If Edom says, we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, the Lord of hosts says, they may build, but I will tear down. And they will be called the wicked country and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Your own eyes shall see this, and you shall say, Great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel. I have loved you. What an amazing statement coming from God. When we hear these words, we should hear them as if God is directly saying them. Now it's Malachi that's saying this. Now, scholars argue, is Malachi a real person? We don't know anything about him. We don't know who his father was. We don't know from what part of Israel or Judah he's from. We're not given all of the extra information. His name literally means my messenger. But I'm going to treat Malachi as if he's a real person. Perhaps it's just God's messenger. But for just ease, and the other prophets all seem to be actual people, even though we don't always have their parents or where they're from, I'm going to treat Malachi as if he was an actual person and say Malachi was speaking this, but he was doing so on behalf of the Lord. So when he says, I have loved you, says the Lord. God is literally saying to Israel, I have loved you. And that's not a past tense love. All right, so for, for my grammar nerds out there, just a little bit, that's a I have loved and still love you statement. Not like I used to love you. I have loved you. The God who was able to say, let there be light, is saying to a group of people, I love you. The God who created and fashioned all of their inward parts looks at them and says, I've loved you. The one who causes the rain to fall and sometimes snow. And the one who gives sunny days that are perfect, that as soon as you walk outside, go, ah, if every day could be like this. Looks down and says, I've loved you. And God, knowing Israel's response, hears their question that they've not vocalized, 
He didn't say this and then the people responded. God's giving, this is your response. How? That's an audacious thought. That God might say, I have loved you, and for anybody to respond, how have you loved us? Look at what Israel had been through. They'd been through constant wars all around them, and they've been through 70 years of captivity. By this point, they have returned back to Israel, but things have not always been great. In the heartbeat of the people as they are now back in their land and things are somewhat quiet, as quiet as they really get for Israel. And God says, I've loved you. The people in their hearts are going, I just don't see it. And before we pass judgment on them, Let's stop and think about the number of times we've responded to God telling us that he loved us with the same exact thought. Now, we would never vocalize it. We're spiritual people and we know that you're not supposed to say that. But in our times of suffering, in our thoughts have gone, why is this happening to me? Man, there's a lot of people out there that are a lot worse than me, and things seem to be going great for them. If God loves me so much, why am I going through this? Right? And God knows you're thinking that. You don't have to vocalize it for God to know that that's where our heart goes. When we're in the waiting room, and the doctors aren't coming back with good news, If God loves me, why am I going through this? For those who are in school, the question of the title of one of my favorite titled books. The book wasn't great, but I've never forgotten the title. If God loves me, why can't I get my locker open? (laughs) It's still in print, by the way. If God loves me, Why aren't things better? How have you really loved me, God? Because I look around and the world's a mess. I look around and my family's falling apart. I look around and people that I love are being in accidents. People that I love are losing their jobs. People that I love are alone. And to be quite honest, right now, my life could be a lot better than it is. How have you loved me, God? If that's where you're at today, his initial answer isn't going to bring you comfort. And at first, I was annoyed by that when I was putting this together. I, when I ask one of those heart-wrenching questions, I want the answer to come back soft. I wanted to come back with, oh, my beloved, I'm always there. Don't give me a history lesson. That's what God does. Look at his answers. But you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? You want to talk about a left field answer? And plus, my mama taught me, you never answer a question with a question. God doesn't listen to my mother, so he does. Oh, he hears her. Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord, yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. Now, this is one of those troubling areas in Scripture that we always have to deal with, and the problem is the answer isn't always the same. Now, there are some times when you have the love and hate comparison side by side, it means that we're talking about degrees here. You need to love something to so much of a higher degree that even your love for this other thing would be like hatred if shown to this, this area. All right? 
For example, when Jesus says, if you love me, you must hate your mother and father. But wait a minute. The commandments say that we must honor them and we are to love our, our parents. So what we understand is the idiom is being used there that we must love Christ so much more than we love any earthly attachments that in comparison, one would seem like hate as to how much we love the other one. Sometimes that's how it's used, but not always. In this, and how, how am I supposed to know? I'm glad you asked. See, I can ask your questions too. Context, context, and all right, make sure you're awake. All right. When we look at this, we notice that the answer between the two is that one is receiving something positive and one is receiving something negative. It's not that you love them both, but one just a lot more. There's a definite choice that is taking place. And he's looking at Jacob and Esau, going back to history and going, one I chose... One I rejected. One I showed favor upon. And one I've shown disdain towards. So if you remember, there was animosity between Jacob and Esau. And it all came down to the fact that Esau had stolen his birthright and his blessing. Well, he bought his birthright. He stole his blessing. But despite all of that, God had already declared... That Jacob, the younger one, the deceiver, was the one that he was choosing to use to carry on the blessing given to Abraham. Now, I don't know if you've ever had a brother or a sister, but there are times in the lives of siblings where there's rivalry between the two. And you have to gauge who's the stronger, who's the taller, who's the smarter, who's the more good looking. And you use all of these methods to figure it out. And by every measurable detail, Jacob won over Esau. And they both had a lot of descendants. And if I can put it as mildly as I could put it, they did not get along. The descendants of Jacob are Israel. The descendants of Esau are Edom. The one talked about in verse 4. If Edom says, those are the descendants of Esau. So when we go back into this, we know that God is not telling Israel, you should hate the Edomites. He's saying, I have hated Esau. But he's not telling Israel to hate them. In fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 7, God specifically tells Israel, You shall not abhor an Edomite, for he is your brother. You love them. But I've chosen you, not them. And when Israel was taken off into captivity, into Babylon... Edom gloated and helped the plunder. The Edomites had gone against God's chosen people, and his wrath rose. Why? Because to Israel he says, I love you. Now, I've met some mild-mannered people, and a lot of times I try to consider myself to be a relatively mild-mannered person. The way to get my anger to rise the fastest is to do something against one of my three ladies. And it's an involuntary response. You go against one of my three ladies, something inside of me rises up in anger, and I want to destroy you. In love. And a lot of people in this room fully understand that. That when you love someone, if someone goes against them, you turn in wrath towards that opposing person. When the Edomites 
went against Israel, God's wrath was kindled. And so now, understanding that background of what the Edomites had done to Israel, mocking them, giving them trouble all throughout Israel's history, when Israel says, how have you loved us? We were kicked out of our land. We had to come back, and we had to take from other nations, and we had to do all of these things. How have you loved us? God says, "Uh, remember Jacob and Esau? Which one did I choose? It wasn't them. It was you. And look at where they are now. My armies were not sent against you, Israel. They were sent against the Edomites. Oh, it's because Israel was so good, right? Because Israel had done so many wonderful things. They were completely faithful all throughout their lives. They followed all of God's commandments. They were totally faithful, right? That's why, if you know your history, you know that's laughable. Year after year, Israel rebelled against God. They were constantly doing the opposite of what God had told them to do. God didn't love Israel because Israel was awesome. God loved Israel because God is faithful. And so he looked upon the Edomites and laid waste to the hill country and left their heritage to the jackals of the desert. And if Edom should dare say, verse 4, we are shattered, but we will rebuild. Right? That's what Israel did. Israel was laid desolate. And they came back, we will rebuild. We'll rebuild our walls. We'll rebuild the temple. We're going to build it back up. If Edom says, hey, if they can do it, we can do it. We're going to rebuild. It's not going to happen. They may build, but I'm going to tear it down. They'll be called the wicked country and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Still going. That's a very important word because as we look at how this applies to us and what we can understand, what we need to understand about our God is what he said to Israel reveals his character. And it's not just national Israel that God chose. If you believe in Jesus Christ and your faith is in his cross and what he has done for you, God chose you in the world he's hated. Wait a minute, God so loved the world. Yes, God loved the world and sent his son. Not that all of the world would be saved, but those who believe, the believing group is saved. And not not everybody's a fan of this, But i got to say it anyway because it's what the Bible says. God has determined the people that he would choose. He gets to make that choice. and Because I wanted to make it as as clear as possible so that if you want to argue with me, you got to argue with Paul. Paul makes it very clear in Ephesians chapter 1. Some of you thought I was going to say Romans 9. But Ephesians 1, I think, makes it as clear as it can possibly be when he says, beginning in verse 3, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Before he said, let there be light, God chose us. Paul continues. In love, he predestined us. Now, don't get hung up on that word predestined. It just means God determined the destiny before he made you. Okay, so that's just what it means. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. God determined to choose you. But what about the suffering I'm going through? He chose you. 
But this is hard. He chose you. But I don't know if I'm going to find another job. He chose you. He demonstrates his love to you by the fact that you can sit there saying, though everything around me may fail, Jesus has already died on the cross for my sins, and nothing can take that away. I have a certainty in that. Well, how can I have certainty? Because Ephesians continues. In verse 7, In him, Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him, Christ, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. God determined to choose you. That was his plan, that he would save you. And he did all of the work that was necessary for it by sending his son into the world to die on the cross that your sins might be placed on him And then when you believed in him, he gave you his Holy Spirit as a seal, a guarantee, something God can't take back. And should he not give you what he's promised, you get to keep his Holy Spirit. Which means God no longer God if God doesn't do what he's promised to you. How do you know that he loves you? It's evident in the fact that you believe in the cross of Jesus Christ. He chose you. And while the rest of the world seems like things are going really well right now, and they may be trying to build all of the monuments to themselves that they can possibly build, eventually, verse 5 will also be for us in a different manner. Your own eyes shall see this, and you shall say, Great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel. One day we will see God's judgment poured out not just on Edom, but on the world who hated him. And when our eyes see God's judgment, we won't go, Oh, what a mean God. And we won't go, Oh, that's not fair. When we see God's judgment poured out on the world, we will say, Our God is great, and he's not limited. Great is the Lord beyond the border of his people. Wherever God is, he is great. And for those who have rejected him, he will be great in wrath. And for those who have trusted in his son, Jesus Christ, he will be great in mercy. And so the question that I would put before you today upon looking at this, realizing that God's anger burns forever, not for a day, but forever. What do you believe? Do you believe that God has loved you? And that he's demonstrated that love by sending his son to die on the cross for your sins? To be buried in a tomb, but to raise again on the third day? Does God love you? Or do you believe, well, he just must hate me because my life is so bad and everything's awful. He hates me. I guess I'll try and work better and work harder and make him happy. Those who understand that God loves them and call upon his name to be saved will be saved. 
and will be shown mercy. Great mercy. But those who are trying to do it for themselves will understand the great and eternal condemnation that God pours out on those he does not love. I have loved you, says the Lord. Let's pray. Father, our eyes often turn to our circumstances and we may begin to believe that you have not loved us. I pray, Father, that you turn our eyes not to our circumstances, not through all of the the hardships of our lives, but help our eyes to see what you have done before we were even born, before the world was even formed. And help us to know that the day is coming where we will see your judgment poured out upon those who have refused you. Those who did not want you. And we pray, Lord, that you would call to us today. And that you would cause us to respond in faith to what you have done for us. That we would know your love because of what you have already done. And that we would be confident in your eternal love for the ones you've chosen. So speak to us now. For we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You might say to me, well, if he's already chosen people, then it doesn't matter what I do. To which I would say that's false. That's not understanding what I'm saying at all. Yes, God has chosen to save, but he calls all to respond. We're called to respond to him in faith. And so right now, if you believe this, it's time to respond. It's time to say, yes, I believe this. So I'm going to give you that opportunity. We're going to sing this song, and if you need to respond because you believe this, then I want you to come forward and share that with me, and I want to help show you through scriptures that you might have certainty what Christ has done for you. So if you need to respond. Jesus calls to you, answer him. (laughs) Don't turn away. And know that when he loves you, there is no greater joy. There's no greater joy than experiencing the love of our Savior. Let's receive the benediction together as one family. Almighty God, maker of heaven and earth, thank you for loving us, and thank you for showing us your love. Open our eyes that we might see it, regardless of what, what the world may be showing us. And now, Father, as we leave this place today, guard our hearts and our minds by granting us your peace. Amen.